Okay, welcome to the broadcast. This is Tony Muga. You also know me as Patrick Penry. I have a YouTube channel, WordPress blog, and I've been doing some blog talk radio. I was just on the Jason Herb exposing faux capitalism last Sunday. But what I'm doing now is kind of retooling, and I'm going to come back with a different format and learning from my mistakes and accepting constructive criticism. I'm going to attempt to improve, and what I'm going to what I mean by that is I'm going to try to focus more on the documents, and I want to systematically go through the more important ones from start to finish rather than bouncing around or getting a new document and jumping right on that, but maybe not finishing, completing, and going through the document and, and discussing it with everyone who's interested in hearing about this. So that's kind of my new plan. I don't know if I'll go two hours. I probably won't. I want to keep it a little bit shorter, a little more focused, less opinion from me, and if I do have opinion, I will try to keep it as focused on the point of discussion as possible. I will alternate shows where tomorrow night I think it's very important that I discuss the fact that climate change is really weaponized weather, and we need to talk about this because it does tie in exactly with the nuclear industry when tonight I hear on the news that climate change <clears throat> is being blamed by the coal, oil, and natural gas is going to take the blame for climate change. And when you see the chemtrails and the heart returns and you study that, you really know there's something else at play here, and it's a big hoax like everything else. So tonight we're going to return to the 507-page document, and this is the one some of you may remember about the controversial thyroid doses to children in California. And so this will include some uh, discussion about the modeling. And let's dig right in. Oh, by the way, let me quickly add, I won't just go through one document start to finish and it's gone forever. I will then break down into certain categories things that are relevant and section them off to themselves. For instance, I've got a file that's where it talks about where they want to take things offline. It's not for discussion. They know they're being recorded. Let's uh, just talk, talk about it after the phone call. It's politically sensitive. And so I group that into one folder. And when I get a bunch of those in there, we'll come back one night and we'll look at these individual folders. And I'll say, look, here's my folder about how they're looking into media to see who's writing about them. And they're going to do damage control and assess the situation. i got a whole folder here that's all sort of them looking into – the Associated Press and MSNBC you know, articles or, or videos on TV or whatever. So I'll try to, to keep them in these little categories and then tie that all into the big picture later on. So the document won't be shoved to the side forever. We'll cover the relevant, important points, and then we'll come back to certain sections and to tie it all in and, and things that are relative to each other, if that makes sense. So let's go right from the beginning. And by the way, if you go into the, the post I've got under Blog Talk, you can find a link where I went to the WordPress blog I'm covering Plumegate today, and I post it up in numerical order. And I'm going to change the way I do this, too, where I'm actually going to – you'll see the page, the page of the document it came from. Then there will be a brief description of what it was. But I'll have it in a way where it shows in sequential order. And so I'll still make an adjustment there. <clears throat> so – if you can, follow along with me. While I've got it on my mind, I quickly want to thank Shazam, number one, and the YouTube channels, Miss Milky the Clown, Resonate, that's R3ZN8, numerical 8D, 2012 Truthers, Itchy Sax 4, Red Button Studios, and the Buru Magic 2012. And especially Resonate, I was very pleased to see he was carrying one of my broadcasts. So thank you very much, sir. Now I'm going to read straight from one that I call a bulldozer because, and this I'll put in a file that talks about just how bad it was. And I'll get a bunch of good stuff together, and then one night I'll just blast you with the re reality of the situation on the ground at Fukushima right after the disaster, what they really have been trying to downplay. <clears throat> Jack says, yes, Mike, I don't know that we've had anybody – say that the fuel is covered with water, what I can tell you is there's clear evidence of a very significant hydrogen explosion. The only source of hydrogen that could feed that explosion is the spent fuel pool. 
So there must have been very, very high temperature zirconium interacting with water. There's no visible vapors emanating from Unit 4 spent fuel pool area, which would be indicative of no water. It could also be indicative of a fully cooled core. That does not, there's no source of cooling water going into the spent fuel pool. So to have a very significant hydrogen explosion and then to think about the fuel being covered, those are kind of non sequitur concepts. We do know that there were parts of debris that the areas of debris around Unit 4 after the explosion, which were contributing to very significantly high dose rates. And I understand that bulldozers were used to bulldoze that debris under some soil shielding. And the dose rates went down dramatically. I think also now that's crossing my mind, I may have missed a section here again where they talk about the incredibly high dose rates. I don't know if that shows up in here, but I think in the beginning I might have missed a couple pages here because as I read that, I'm thinking also of another section where they say the workers won't go in because the dose rates are too high. They're refusing to go in. <clears throat> They'll use bulldozers to push the dirt over, and then that knocks the rims down enough that they can go in. And then it also clears the way for trucks and equipment to come in as well. Okay, the next I'm going to read is another one that's indicative of just how serious it is after a meltdown or multiple meltdowns. Male participant, right. Male participant, I was wondering, is there anywhere we have, like, dose rate maps on site so that we check Castro? I think we have that somewhere. Yes, I think we do. And it's bad, Jack, between units. I remember some numbers between units two and three, the two buildings, it's 450 to 600 R. That would be REM. Male participant, okay, yes, I saw that, too. Chuck Castro, so you're talking lethal doses here, or certainly Chuck Castro, right. Now, whether that's, you know, modulizing the construction and flying it on a helicopter as much as you can modulize it and flying it in and have people go in and bolt it up, that's the question. If you get some kind of nozzle that goes into the spent fuel pool out the side of the floor, down the wall of the building, and then has an elbow that goes towards the ocean, have that as a piece and hang that off the building on a helicopter and then bring in another piece and lay it down towards the ocean, another straight piece of pipe, and another, and another until you get to the ocean. And then you've got to have some poor people run in there and bolt it up in a Humvee. We suggested to them last night, yesterday, that they get some Humvees and strap lead to the Humvees like they strap metal. And order the Humvee itself, I don't know much how shielding a Humvee gives, but put lead on a Humvee because one of the things is they're getting all that dose in the transit time to the to the job to and from. Okay, so that shows you that's indicative of the extremely high rims you can have. I accidentally read that backwards. The other one should have come first. I apologize for that. But that shows the extremely high rims that they were suffering and the fact one of the, you know, concoctions they come up with is to hang lead on the side of a Humvee to get in there to even try to do work because this shows you have to take into consideration the logistics of traveling to and from the site, and as you get closer, naturally logic dictates that the radioactivity will increase. Okay, here's another on the death pole discussion, and this one is really telling. <clears throat> Let me read it through for you. Male participant. One question the chairman got today down in the hearing was, how many people died at Chernobyl inaudible? Multiple inaudible speakers male participant. I have like 49 male participant. Oh, no, because the inaudible. Is that the question, what the question was about? Male participant. No, it's how many people died. Male participant. Do you include like the children that died of cancer or whatever? Because then you get into inaudible. The number is about inaudible. 49 is inaudible. Multiple inaudible speakers. <laughs> okay, sorry. I have to laugh at this here because in these inaudible parts, what he's saying is that when you tally up the cancer fatalities from Chernobyl, as they well know, and as we've discussed before, the fact they refer to Chernobyl quite often, we know all about Chernobyl, we know all about Three Mile Island, they're modeling off of the fallout from those events, so we know they're, they're aware of the seriousness of what really happens, and they know about the true number of cancer fatalities if you you really research it, it's in the hundreds of thousands. And so that's what he's saying here. He says, oh, no, because the, the he says, the then you get into inaudible, the thousands. I'm probably, I'm again, I'm assuming, I'm, this is speculation, but it would make sense. 
because then you get into the thousands or hundreds of thousands maybe thing. The number is about, and, and my estimate, sir, my research has led me to believe over 900,000 certainly is a conservative estimate of people that die from cancer over the years, not in the first year, second year, but 20, 30, 40 years, you're still having adverse effects from these incidents. So this is also indicative. If you look at the moments when it's inaudible, again, as I've written, it's very convenient, decidedly convenient in circumstances like this that it goes inaudible all of a sudden. We don't get to hear that. Well, I've got a pretty good ear. Maybe I can get a tape of that and I'll be able to pick it out and help these transcribers out, the Neil R. Gross court reporters and transcribers. Maybe they're looking for a good ear up there in, in New York. What do you pay? Okay, the next one. No info, worst case on the rascal run. Jack. Okay, we have to be careful. We have not done yet a worst case analysis. And I'm not sure we're attempting right now to define how we would do such an analysis and what we would offer as the worst case. And there's a redacted section here, paragraphs worth. And to be quite honest, the information that we're able to get on the condition of the core and the condition of the reactor coolant capability, the condition of the containment is very, very limited. We get information through a number of sources, many of them open sources. We do not have an information path directly from the operators, very different than what we would experience here in the United States. This is telling in a couple of areas that they're, they haven't immediately done a worst-case analysis. You would, you, would, you would think logic and rationale would say, look, the first thing you do is give me a worst-case scenario. That's what the military does all the time. They don't say, give me the best-case scenario, and we'll just hope for that. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Give me a worst-case scenario. And indeed, the Japanese, um, was it the ambassador or the prime minister? I had to go back and look. One of them was asking for, one of these higher level guys was asking for a quote unquote more pessimistic model. In other words, he was saying, you're giving me a best case scenario here, and maybe my constituents are asking questions, especially considering the 50 mile evacuation zone that JAXCO rightfully asked for, one of the righteous things that JAXCO has done, and he's not a total bad guy. In fact, I hear now he's kind of sent on his way because he's not entirely as pro-nuclear as they would like him to be. So, and secondly, on this piece, not to get distracted, that's part of my focus, it is the fact that information is quite limited at some times for some people in the arena of the team we've sent over there. Now, certainly others at a higher level probably get better information. And you want to keep in mind that our military has technology with which they're able to measure radiation in the DOE and other other departments as well. So the capability is certain there, certainly there. The excuse to say we didn't have good information is not going to fly with me when they're, they already know about Three Mile. They know about Chernobyl and they admit to that. And you certainly have the ability to model a worst-case scenario. And if you don't, you've got no business being in this business. You really don't. So there's a total lack of excuses in that area from them that will work. One of those situations is a fact that none of them are good. So I suggest in the future, until we get these plants shut down, we get a, uh, some kind of modeling program to give us a worst-case scenario beyond the 1,000 miles out. If it doesn't work, if it's a limited range kind of model, we have to go beyond that because, indeed, we know that radiation is not just limited to the Japanese area or, the, or that particular area of the world. Okay, next frame. Jack, yes, it makes sense, except that talked about the fact that the assessment that was done was a hypothetical worst case. I mean, I think that those are the words in it. I don't have it in front of me. Jack, yes, okay, yes, it does say worst case analysis on a very bad. I would not consider that a worst case, to be quite honest with you, because it assumes only half of one of the spent fuel pools melted, and one spent fuel pool is okay. So I wouldn't, I think we had to use our language carefully here and we'll work that up so that the next inaudible that comes out in six in the morning is better. So what we see here is when they do look at a worst-case scenario, someone here, and I don't know if this is two different jacks. Again, this is Neil R. Gross, court reporters and transcribers out of New York. This is two separate jacks or what's going on here. I'd have to hear the tape talking back and forth on this particular frame. But quite clearly, they, when they do model a quote-unquote worst-case scenario, someone is in there and say, hey, it's really not worst-case. It's only half of one spent fuel pool. And you know, to me, a worst-case is you look at the spent fuel pools, 
you look at the number of cores that could possibly have a criticality, and then you say worst case scenario, and it is worst case. You keep that in mind. You add all those up. You say we've got if we have six plants and six spent fuel pools, I would model a 12 source term. And I'd say, hey, this is absolute mind-blowingly worst case. It'll never be worse than this. And then let's go back from there and, and, and model backwards. And then at some point you come to a, a nice spot where you can begin to give recommendations and rainwater warnings like other countries have. We did not in America, multiple other countries did give rainwater warnings and had children stay out of the rain during uh, going to and from school. They would take the day off and not go, go on those days. Okay, this next one and I've titled No Priority. Male participant, Josh, while we're waiting, if you could get a chance to talk to the chairman. Josh, yes, male participant. The request from our end from the PMT, that's the Protective Measures Team, the request from our end from the PMT, of course, you know, we are waiting for a lot to run through NARAC. That's the guys that do the modeling. and I'm pretty sure they're underneath DOE, if I remember correctly. So we're waiting on a lot to run through NARAC. We're not getting priority, you know, and so there's aerial data that the runs that we needed to have done, we are not we are not get priority for it. Again, this is rough transcription. I'll try to make it a little better for you. We are not getting priority for it. So that's just an FYI. We've been waiting quite a while to get that back. He says, say it again how he would say it, male participant. Okay, Josh, we're not getting priority from male participants. We're not getting priority from NARAC through, I guess, NIT, which is, this comes out of the Agostino shop, as I understand it. Don't know what that is, personally, guys. I, I'm not sure what Agostino is. Josh, okay, male participant, and others are getting priority. Now, these may be requests from the White House or from NMSA or whatever, but, Josh, not getting priority from NARAC to male participant, to get the runs done that we need to have done. They have put us in a queue, but others are higher in the queue, so we're not getting the information back that we need. Josh, for what? What is it that we're doing? Male participant, these are runs that are done to try to do dose projections out beyond 50 miles, including as far as the U.S. coast. Male participant, now, Josh, if they're prioritizing the runs, they need to make assessments for Tokyo. Male participant, right? Male participant, for the wind shift over the weekend, male participant, yes, but we don't know. Male participant, but we don't know. Male participant, we don't have enough information to know what is top priority in the queue and where we are in the queue. Josh, okay. Male participant, we put a request in. They simply said, we'll get to them when we get to them. Josh, okay, but like I said, we don't need to go out to the U.S. because at this point, that is being done by them. Male participant, unfortunately, what our concern is is the calculations are showing extremely high doses, and we don't think they're credible. Josh, no, no, no. They have, that has been corrected. Male participant, okay, well, we hadn't seen that. So, again, you see a little discombobulation there in their cue to try and get information back, and he says, we put a request in. They simply said, quote, we'll get to them when we get to them. End quote. The guy's quoting someone else. It's, it's, again, it's like it's not a priority for some reason. I don't understand. And this, this shows if you, if you look at nuclear power and you think they're like an NFL football team, that they, they go out and they, they practice their plays, they work out in the gym, they plan for all contingencies. And if you think it's just a limited game like a football game and they go out and execute, you're quite mistaken. There's so many random variables at play you see clearly in an incident a major catastrophe that sometimes they're having to wing it, sometimes they're discombobulated, information isn't flowing, some people are trying to cover stuff up. You really get an insight in some of these sections as to the inner workings of the nuclear industry and really just what a, what in my opinion, what a mess it really is. Next frame, number eight, titled these diplomacy skills. In this section of documents, I call them the Cali documents because it talks about the doses to California children. So that's the kind of the term I've hung on this one. Jack, okay. And then the last thing has to do with your team. My sense is that you've gotten about six hours of sleep since you landed, and you guys are going to be there for the long haul. And I was wondering, are you getting into some sort of predictable rotation where folks are getting rest? 
And do you have the right people there? Do you need different people? Because we're planning on sending the next wave over, the next tsunami of responders. I apologize for that. The next wave over. And we want to make sure it's the right people at the right time. Do you have any thoughts on that? Chuck, yes, what I'd like to do is each of the people that are over here, I would like for them to give me a list or look at the list and tell me who they think is the best person to replace them. Most people know someone at their talent level in the agency, so I would give everybody a chance to weigh on me a recommendation. And then we map that together with your list and make sure we're comfortable with the people we're sending. So this morning I was going to ask the team here to come up with two or three names. Or we could have them look at your list and say, hey, this is a good person, that's a good, that's the right person, whatever. Jack, okay, so what I hear you saying is that you don't anticipate needing more people than what you have. That your skill sets seem to be the right skill sets and you're particularly sensitive to the political and diplomacy aspects of each of the responsibilities. Did I pretty much capture it? Chuck, yes. The best science person can't bring science to it if they don't have the right diplomacy skills. Jack, I understand. Jack, yes, I wouldn't spend too much on that. What I'm most concerned about, we'll find the right people. What I'm most concerned about is the expertise. Do you have the right expertise? Do you have the, Chuck, Jack, an audible, concerned about who comes over with the expertise and the skill sets and the diplomacy? It's more you can't just say, hey, we need a severe accident guy, and Joe is the, be the best severe accident guy. There's a lot, huge political element to this. So it's got to be somebody with diplomacy skills. Okay, and that section I captured and saved because, well, you define diplomacy skills after hearing that. When they mention, you know, I would buy diplomacy skills you're working with the Japanese and trying to, you know, get along with them as, as that kind of comprehending it that way, except when they mention the political element. And taking the larger aspect, we already know, and we'll read about this in a minute, where she says, take it offline, it's politically sensitive. Again, we're being compromised because things are politically sensitive. It was an election run-up, and that's a big reason why Plumegate and these documents have been suppressed. Okay, next I have titled DOE Plume Data. This is um, frame number 12. Jack, sounds like we're connected there. The second thing is radiation measurement data. We're on the phone, I think, it's every six hours with DOE now. Male participant, it's more frequent. Jack, more frequent than that? Are you getting the radiation? Because you, because we're just getting the AMA, AMS data from DOE, and I want to make sure that you guys are getting that as quickly as we are. And we have a shared set of information on radiation measurements as well. That actually wasn't a question, that first part. He says, more frequent than that. That was a statement. I said it as a question. That's right. More frequent than that, period. So they're very frequently, this is more than every six hours there on the phone with the DOE. Chuck, yes, we had it earlier. We had the data earlier. They had a PowerPoint presentation they were carrying up to the ambassador, and they wanted to run it by me before they showed it to the ambassador. That's the reason that it seems like we're not getting the data. The guys already had it. I just got into the office 30 minutes ago, so our guys, Jack Foster and others, had already looked at the data. Male participant, exactly. Chuck, are we getting peri periodic plume maps from GIS Central? Do you know? Chuck, not yet. Male participant, because I haven't seen one in a while. Chuck, no, I haven't seen one at all. Have you seen an actual measured plume map? Male participant, is that a question? Chuck, yes. Male participant. I haven't seen one in a couple of days. I haven't seen one in a couple of days. I mean, I'm assuming that you're mapping changing of net conditions that we would inaudible. Jack, I think you have all the information we have. Okay, and that shows right there that they're not only talking about modeling a plume now, but they're talking about one having previously. I haven't seen one in a couple of days. And I'll have a folder that shows evidence to plume, plume modeling, and whether you believe their measurements of what they're expecting radiation to be on the West Coast and in America, whether you believe that or not, once you study Three Mile and Chernobyl and the bird study and this, and this mortality index study, you, you really can only come to one conclusion that, and they've already been proven liars, so you can only conclude again that there's a lot of deception going on. They're not being quite honest. I might add that I recently looked up the protective action guidelines from EPA and five REM, R-E-M, per year. 
Okay, you don't need to be a scientist to understand the REM and curious and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but more importantly, a, a pregnant woman is allowed 0.5 REM per year. A woman working at a nuclear power plant who is, becomes pregnant is only allowed 0.5 REM per year. She exceeds that, they send her home. She cannot come back. She cannot come back, not legally anyway. So that's what I want to keep in mind. For a woman with a pregnant child, the doses are quite low that would affect them. And if Taiwan sent school children home to avoid rain and gave rainwater warnings when in California the levels were ten times as high, according to the article, that does not bode well for our government, nor does it bode well for the nuclear industry and these captains of industry, right? Okay, moving right along. Frame 14, Cali doses to children. This is the this is the one that was pretty big, and if you haven't heard it, this is a good one. Revealing one, I should say. None of this is good, but all of this is revealing. And I guess I should have picked up who was coming in here. I'll just say male participant for the moment. I guess I'll turn to Rob Lewis to cover a couple of items from the protective measures perspective. Mr. Lewis. Okay, good morning. I will cover four things that occupied most of the protective measures team time last night. First, there was a flight by Narek last night. They did the modeling. And the flight landed roughly right after midnight. And the data became just available to us about an hour ago. So we're in the process of obtaining and analyzing the data from the inaudible. We also are working. There was a request coming from last night before last evening shift to develop projections for doses in California. And that is, has been in process. We will need to, in order to do that, we will need to engage with, we already have engaged with the Office of Research. We're looking to engage further with Sandia, and that's a laboratory that does modeling, with Sandia to make some modifications to the inaudible to effectuate those dose estimates in California. In conjunction with that, there is a DITRA and Merrick dose estimate that was done for California that we obtained as part of the DOE briefing package. And those were estimating what we believe to be very high doses to children and a thyroid inaudible dosage. We think that inaudible, extremely conservative modeling related to those doses and assumptions. It's a thyroid dose that involves deposition of material and inaudible integrated the dose over a year or two. For example, drinking milk from the same cow that's grazing on the same contaminated field the entire time, things like that. But once we get the inaudible, we will have something to compare an audible. Also, when we saw those dose estimates, we looked at the historical record for any kind of information related to Chernobyl, actual deposits that were measured. We did find some, and an audible, dose activity per area of deposits that were estimated. I think they were provided from DIPSA. We did the same dose calculations with those concentrations, and the doses were approximately 1,000 times lower. So we were in the 1 to 10 millirem range versus full rem range, which was full rem thyroid dose range, which was being inaudible by DOE and DOE inaudible. We also have been working to clarify the assumptions that support the two rascal runs that are attached to the inaudible. I think that means press release is what they're talking about there because I've read elsewhere the two rascal runs that were attached to a press release. So I think that inaudible... I'm very confident that that is the press release they're referring to. Because we have also been working to clarify the assumptions that support the two rascal runs that are attached to the very likely press release. We looked at the different assumptions behind those two runs, and we think we have developed a good story of why those runs may look a little different to some of our inaudible. And finally, we got some additional site and dose information. Most notably on that is the doses at the main gate area have increased from what we have previously heard. They're in the range of 150 millirem per hour to one rem per hour at the site boundary. And there's a notable point, 300 feet above unit 3 in the air, there is a dose reading of 375 rem per hour. So that completes the protective measures the Protective Measures Team Summary, PMT Summary. I'd I cut in and remind everyone that Unit 3 is where MOX fuel was being used in, in Unit 3, and that's the one most worrisome because we see very little mention of plutonium or uranium. They don't, they don't test plutonium or uranium because the half-life is thousands of years. It's the deadliest substance known to man. 
And iodine and cesium relatively have a very short half-life, I believe eight days when it, we talk about iodine. So keep that in mind. At Unit 3, here is some evidence of some 375 rem per hour in the air, 300 feet above Unit 3. Unit 3, clearly the most damaged of, of the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi, and this is very worrisome because, A, no one's talking about this, and, B, we know something happened there. So it's quite strange that there's a complete lack of discussion from industry and our government about plutonium. Specifically, plutonium is what I'm worried about, the nano form in the MOX fuel. Continuing along. Mike, Rob, this is an audible. I have a question for you. This request for doses in California projected with, I guess, worst case assumptions, is that correct? An audible. Mr. Lewis, I believe the doses that we saw from DITRA represented a source term of 100% of the inaudible. Mike, okay, and where is this information being considered for releasing publicly, like we do with the press release? Mr. Lewis, which information are you speaking about? Mike, I'm talking about these projected dose models, the models that you, the ones that you are doing and coordinating with other agencies. Is there some thought about releasing this publicly? Mr. Lewis, we have not had that discussion at this time. Now, mind you, this what is this one from the 17th? This is, you know, a number of days after the accident. Okay, this isn't the first day. It was the first day and they hadn't had a discussion to release. They weren't going to release information. I understand you're just information's coming in. But this far into it, I have to bring this up real quick and look. I believe it's about a week into it. By then, really, you know, it's time to release the worst of the worst or at least something in that direction more than they did. They they really downplayed it to such – it's a, it's, it would be laughable if the mortality index study wasn't so shocking. So he's, he continues, he's, he's talking about projected dose models. What information are you talking about? He says, we haven't had a discussion this time about releasing these mo this models to the public. Mike, and don't take that as a suggestion to an audible. I'm just curious as to how we came upon doing that with our press release. And then are we advocating that for any future press releases here for doses in the U.S.? Mr. Dorman, Mike, this is Dan. No, no, we're not planning any press release with this information. This is a projection that we were requested to run. Separate from our being requested to run that, we got this DOE briefing package that had this other bit to run in it. And we're not, I don't know what prompted theirs or all the assumptions that went into theirs, but it obviously caught our attention, and we're looking to get what we think would be more realistic projection. I want to stop there because every time I read these, it's, you know, it's like reading a poem or, or a piece of philosophy or a a section out of the Bible, sometimes you have to read it multiple times. Parts in the book of Zechariah, I would read 10, 15 times and just contemplate it to try and understand exactly what was being said. Well, this is very similar. I come back through and and we look here and we see this one from DOE, the, the Department of Energy is sending down. It's, it's obviously kind of bogus. And the guy's saying, we want more realistic projections. The Japanese prime minister is saying, we want more pessimistic models. And if I've got to rate them, I rate NRC above DOE, although I'll tell you now, NRC is pro-nuclear in the long run, and they have no intention at this moment in time of even discussing systematically shutting down and decommissioning these dangerous plants. Oyster Creek, my understanding is it is, it is identical or basically identical to the Fukushima uh, Mark I containments, and this is one that's over here in the United States. It's even older. It's even older. So something to keep in mind. Okay, we see DOE is not sending them realistic projections. And even Mr. Dorman saying we're looking at something. Now, not that they're going to release it publicly, of course, but they're still looking for at least within themselves to have a little better idea what's, what's going to go on. Other questions? Ms. Howe. Dan, just one moment. And, Rob, this is Linda Howe in Region 4. Rob, I can talk with you offline about some background information for California. The DITRA and DOE runs for California may have been prompted by queries from that state because the state has been conducting interagency conference calls, and DOE, EPA, HHS has been part of those calls. Our regional state liaison officer is also monitoring that. But there's some background that is politically sensitive that I can share with you offline. Well, obviously, to note first is the politically sensitive information offline. They know they're being recorded. Hey, let's take it offline. This FOIA stuff is 
such a pain in the ass, you know. So there's some deception there and some some sneakiness going on. But if we look, the Ditra and DOE runs for California may have been prompted by queries from the state. And the state has been conducting interagency conference calls. So it seems to me like this DOE run is really downplayed. And is this what they want to hand out to the state? Because there's plenty of evidence that the people, Congress persons and people from particular states are not really being given the full upfront facts. They have a they have a lot of talking points and they say, let's route everything to everyone call this place. And then I have a folder I'm going to call the runaround because it's laughable in one part where you just sent the one agency to another agency to another agency and eventually they I guess they just expect you to give up and and quit asking questions. Mr. Dorman. Okay, thanks, Linda. That's good. Mr. Castleman. Rob, this is Pat Castleman. Could we get could the commission offices get copies of those dose projections and plume models that supported the press release and the recommendation that American citizens evacuate out to fifty miles? Mr. Lewis. Well, you have it on the press release, attached to the press release. Do you want something more than that? Ms. Castleman. Yeah, more than that. That's kind of sketchy information. So we would like to get a little bit more information so we can explain to, you know, the commissioner so that an audible currently informed. Mr. Lewis, so a plot of the plume that goes with that. Ms. Castleman, yes, please. So clearly this guy's expecting them to take the press release, and that information should be good enough for you. And they know that's not good enough. They know that's they said, look, we want more of the sketchy. We want a little bit more information. And, and, and he's like, it's, it's for the commissioner, you know, do you mind? The commissioner, can we give him some accurate information? Mr. Lewis, okay, we'll get that out to the commission offices. Ms. Castleman, thank you. Mr. Dorman, okay. Mr. Hicksman, this is Tom Hicksman. Could you please repeat the DITRA projection in our calculation for the thyroid dose rates in California, please? Mr. Lewis, well, our calculations are not done. Mr. Hicksman. But you thought that they might be 1,000 times less or that they are, Mr. Lewis, yeah, the DITRA result was 4 rem to the thyroid of a one-year-old child based on one-year integration of uptake. They, Mr. Hicksman, I think it, Mr. Lewis, what we did during the past shift was look at the actual deposition rates in California from the Chernobyl accident in 1986 and extrapolated that out and came up with a comparable dose rate on the order of 1 to 10 millirem. So that kind of reinforced our disbelief of the DITRA number when we saw it. But then, separately, research is working with Sandia to do a separate run. Male participant. Just for clarity, we want to attribute the calculation for NARAC. Okay, it's not an audible. It's NARAC, the calculation. Mr. Dorman, any other questions? Male participant. And also, to clarify, we don't have a run of it. We just have the output. Male participant, right. Male participant. That suggests the thyroid doses. Mr. Dorman. That's all the questions? Okay, so that shows up in this section here where they talk about Chernobyl. If you read the, I believe it's called Cost and Consequences. I've got a link on one of my past shows. I didn't post it up tonight, but the Russian study with the Nestorinko couple and the Yablokov and Jeanette Sherman was the uh, editor and chief on that study. You can read about Oregon gave rainwater warnings during Chernobyl, and other states did as well. So clearly, we know historically on the West Coast during Chernobyl, there were rainwater warnings. And during Fukushima, which lies directly in the Pacific jet stream path, and had a mock fuel unit, and had more meltdowns, three, according to a little brochure my mom gave me. And, and it's always very sketchy. I'm, I'm almost sometimes don't want to say how many meltdowns or what the damage was because the suppression is so intense, I'm not prepared really to totally commit. You know, I'd like to get some clarification on that. But in here you see clearly that whether they're being realistic with the millirem doses or whatever, they clearly know about Chernobyl and the Chernobyl less deposition in the United States. And if you look back during that time, undoubtedly there would be suppression as well. We know in Russia certainly that there was plenty of a media blackout, and the government was involved with going around to hospitals and seizing files and doing their best to obfuscate any kind of independent study. Again, if it's solar power, these kind of shenanigans don't go on, especially if you unleash the suppressed 
restricted technologies. Okay, next frame, number 24. I've titled this Fees Modeling. Conference call initiated, it says at the top. Mr. McDermott. Josh, this is Brian McDermott. Josh, hey, Brian, real quick. I'm giving you from the chairman a cease and desist on the modeling that we started to attempt to do yesterday with the MAX code to get all the way out to the U.S. Now, the MAX code, my understanding, people, is it's, it is kind of a worst-case kind of a code. It's a more serious assumption of source terms, if my understanding is correct of that. So this would be a more serious uh, model, if you will, the MAX code. That's my understanding anyway. He says, I'm giving you the chairman a cease and desist on the modeling we started to attempt to do yesterday with the MAX code to get all the way to the U.S., the United States. Mr. McDermott, okay. Josh, we don't need to pursue, we would like to stop pursuing that. We don't need to do that anymore. Mr. McDermott, okay. Josh, copy. Mr. McDermott, I copy. Josh, all right, we'll follow up. I can follow up more after the call. Mr. McDermott, Okay, yeah, I'd like to understand. Thank you. Josh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he says it that fast, but really it's it's five yeahs in a row. So yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's got to be fast. I mean, that's the way I'm interpreting it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. McDermott, okay, Josh, thanks. Mr. McDermott, bye. And it just shows that you would you would ask to go ahead and finish the model. I would anyway, just common sense. I wouldn't say cease and desist unless you need the guy to be pulled off for a more serious task. I would say you know, finish your model and bring it to me whether you decide it's much more serious than it really is or just to give me a full range, a full spectrum. That's They use this in military as tactics and strategy in Sun Tzu, the ancient art of war. It's, it's logic and it's common sense. And if you don't do that, you're playing the game in a very strange way that does not give you optimal uh, safety, if I can phrase it that way. It's not giving you the optimal circumstances to keep people safe, especially considering how dangerous these meltdowns really are. Again, these FOIA documents reveal that seriousness of the meltdown. Number 25, frame 25, I call this not over the phone, and this is going to go in my not over the phone folder. Female participant, usually for the inaudible, I don't have to go. It's up to you. I mean, Male participant, I don't think you need to go. I don't, I'm not sure it's productive. Female participant, I think inaudible. Male participant, we would rather have you here. Female participant, you can give me information from the call and male participant. We're not going to get into any detail. Female participant, no, no, no. Male participant, but if they have, female participant. Remember Warren's question yesterday, male participant, yeah. Okay, I got that at 10 o'clock yesterday. Okay, I got that at 10 o'clock yesterday, she says. Female participant, I got that at 10 o'clock yesterday. She's confirming, too. There's a big section of redaction here. Male participant agrees and says, yes. Female participant, nothing from them in 36 hours. That's my point. Male participant, well, it's not 36 hours. They did just the overflight. Is that what you're talking about? Female participant, no, no. And we do not have the information. Male participant, okay. Female participant, on overflight. So, Male participant, work it back through the stages and contacts. Female participant, I think we have worked it back, and we still don't have any. Male participant, if you can't, then I'll escalate it, but outside this call. Female participant, and we would like you to do that. Male participant, okay. Female participant, I'll give you a call. Male participant, let me know how to call. All right, she says. Female participant, all right. So you see, again, there's more evidence of they want, they don't want to, they know they're being recorded. Again, this isn't the first time that the NRC has recorded their transcripts or conversations or meetings and put it into written form where it can be accessed later. So they're well aware of the procedure. And as I like to point out, Lucas Hickson from Informable pointed out early on that they make mention this is not a drill, and they accent, accentuate that to let people know you are being recorded now. And, again, not a lot, a lot of them know what's going on as far as what to say and what not to say. There's people coming and going and new people and people not participating to cover up. But a lot of them, you can see, are doing their best, and there's some shenanigans going on, I'll put it that way. We should not be going on at all. It should be straightforward. This is a very dangerous business. Radiation, cancer, it's a horrific way to die. 
and the mutations caused by radiation. That's no walk in the park either. It's probably best that they would die than those kids in Russia in those rooms. If you've seen those videos, hard to watch. Okay. Next frame. I call this the symmetry. Number 28, Mr. Castro. Certainly. Well, you know, it's just to expound on that a little bit. Let me tell you, DOE, D-A-R-T, DART, U.S. Force, I mean, aircraft carriers, there's a redacted section. I mean, this is huge. The NRC, obviously, I think has been the focal point of it, but there are a lot of people doing a lot of work related to it. Mike Case, and that's great, and we appreciate what you're doing. They did talk about the symmetry that all the DOD, DOE, and NRC people in the team and country are badged and have appropriate dissymmetry and that NRC and others are helping the DART team arrange the appropriate protocols for the symmetry of the staff that are there. They're scrambling somewhat within the Department of Defense to arrange for appropriate dissymmetry. In some cases, their area dissymmetry for some of the ground troops, but that's the best they can do until they can actually equip all the individuals with the HHS came out with a CDC fact sheet on health risk to individuals in Tokyo. Apparently, it's posted on their website. They were going to get around the web address, but I'm sure if it's posted, it ought to be pretty prominent. So I would suggest we pull that up. They did have a call yesterday with the state public health officials and also Canadian representatives. And just to reemphasize what I discussed before, there's a lot of eagerness to get access to the government's modeling results. So we understand what they are, talked about a variety of things with alarms going off at airports and mail being intercepted from Japan. So they are working together. They appreciate the guidance that they got from the NRC and also from DOE. DHS has spoken up and said that they are using the personal rat detection capability that they have as detectors at the airports to passively screen passengers as they return to the United States. They have no elevated readings so far that have caused any concern, but they will coordinate through the interagency to make sure that they're applying the appropriate guidelines. They did have female participants. Mike, they asked what the level was for release of passengers, so we do not issue a, an audible. They don't have a protocol yet for that. Mike, case. Right, okay. Well, they didn't allude to that on the call. Female participants. I understand, but so you're aware of it. Mike Case, okay, male participant. Who would have the lead for that, EPA? Female participant. EPA should, but we've got this issue going on at Audible. Mike Case, they did have 23 hits on cargo, so all those hits were at very low levels. Let me back up real quick to this, what she's saying here. Who would have the lead for that, EPA? This is asked by male participant. Female participant, EPA should, but we've got this issue going on in Audible. In another part of the document, that I've already read over blog talk one night. There's a section where the female participant, I'll call her that for generic terms because I can't remember the name, but she's saying just that. She, she's trying to determine who's got the lead. Who is covering the lead for this? Who's running the show? And, and she, she, she describes being rudely responded to. It's not time for that now or something to that effect, and they never do work it out if I remember correctly. So, again, some more discombobulation. Who's the lead? Who's taking control? This should be with think This is already worked out and they have procedures. It's not new information that Japan is right in the Pacific jet stream line coming over here and it's, the wind flows in that direction. It's not new information. They have nuclear power plants, and this wouldn't be the first incident. There's a previous incident where I think they had a, I don't know if it was a partial melt or a pretty serious accident. So, Japan's history with nuclear power is not perfect either. So this is an interesting part here that shows a little bit of discombobulation. Who's got the lead? Who really knows, you know? And they're also talking about they want to check and keep an eye out for coming back into this country. People with radiation on their shoes or Japanese cars were found to have high levels of radiation food until Hillary Clinton said, you know, I guess they've got some deal to ship their food on over and we're still going to eat their seafood. I won't. I won't. I don't advise you eating any Japanese. I know it sucks for their economy, but I don't want any radiation. Male participant, you said the jet air filter was at 250 micro R. That'd be RIMS. Mike Case, 
267 micro R per hour. Sounds like they just have a micro R meter. Male participant, right. Background conversations. Male participant. What are we talking normal background? Female participant. 250 to 350. At what height are they at? 40,000 feet? Male participant. Yes. Female participant. And they're going to get male participant. Contamination anyway. Female participant from positive radiation. Male participant. Positive. Female participant. We'd have to see what it is and what they find. Male participant. Yes, that's not going to be particulate on the filter. Female participant. I didn't know the filter or the micro R. Male participant. It's micro R per hour, so it sounds like it's a meter reading on a filter. So we don't have any pedigree on that measurement, so take it for what it's worth. So although they're saying it's not much, it's nothing serious, they, you know, in the end he says, take it for what it's worth. Who knows? I mean, we really don't know. Male participant, what are we seeing in the media? Just so you think about this, is that you're seeing things being described in multiples of normal background? Male participant, right. Female participant, right. Male participant. So Vinny's point is, male participant, we don't know. Male participant, if normal background for an air filter flying at 40,000 feet or 37,000 feet is going to be higher than it is here on the ground, certainly, right? Male participant. So those readings may or may not have anything to do with the accident. Mike Case, exactly right. That's a good way to clarify it. So the action item, CDC, is going to share the website information. It's almost as if anything you give them, they're looking to debunk it and downplay it. You know, and who really knows what the, the real fact is because the first thing you do in a cover-up would be to gain control or have control over the people taking these measurements. Just like if you have a hoax, sham election, a rigged election, as Stalin said, it's not who casts the vote, it's who counts the vote. So you want to control those that are taking the radiation measurements. I often refer to an article in Alexander Higgins' blog about the EPA RADNET monitors being rigged, and there is pretty good proof to that effect. And, and the proof was that after they had tampered with them or fiddled with them, as Higgins said, the monitors showed even lower background radiation than prior to the Fukushima accident. So what was a steady baseline of Cold War era bomb testing, I've no doubt, a baseline, that had actually all of a sudden dropped, and wouldn't you know, things around the world got even less radioactive than ever before after Fukushima, according to those monitors and according to that article, which was a, a very well-written article with links and everything. And you could learn about the George Bush crony who was running the RadNet Monitor show. Okay, this next frame, 35, is titled Dry Pools. That's what I've titled it anyway. One of the things I need to talk with you about, Laura, I can see I'm going to have to go back and make sure I don't miss who initially is talking in these. So, again, I say I'm, I'm making corrections. I go along. I promise it will only improve. So someone is saying, we'll say male participant maybe, one of the things I need to talk with you about, Laura, is I don't know what the prognosis is of three days of that spent fuel. Those spent fuel pools sitting there empty. You know, is the building providing enough heat sink that the temperatures have risen and they're going to stabilize and they're not going to go up anymore, you know? Is that the situation where there's enough building, the buildings are conducting the heat away and they're just sitting there? I mean, it's likely all four of those pools are dry. And what's going to happen in three or four days before we get the equipment staged? The second thing we've been talking about here tonight is something that's been brought up before is we pull the water. I mean... I was at the POX event in Hungary. I know about pouring cold water on hot fuel. We all know what that does. That's going to rubbleize those fuel pools. And unlike the POX event, which you only got a gas release because that event happened underwater, here you put that water on that hot fuel and rubbleize it, you're going to get particulate also. So you're going to have some level of significant release when you put that, plus it's being carried away in steam. And I will refer to another section where they, they discuss the mock fuel, the Unit 3. They didn't say mock fuel. I shouldn't say that. They don't say that, okay? But they talk about Unit 3, and they talk about when you blast it with the water, there's going to have, when you, you're going to shoot the source term, I think was the phrase used, you're going to have a major emanation of radiation, right? Again, I stress to people, other countries were considered enough and cared enough about their citizens to do the righteous thing and have rainwater warnings. If you 
if you look at my, my blog post of the sh- of the broadcast tonight, and one of those pictures is a, a picture uh, that I I have my digital camera back then. I didn't have screen capture yet. I'm, again, I'm still learning the laptop and online and everything that goes with it. So the time I used my digital camera, and I captured a picture from I think there's a website from France, and it showed the UK and France, and I think also Japan, obviously. But UK and France gave rainwater warnings, and it shows a picture of the mother and the child and the umbrella above them, and the rain's coming down, and in the rain are the little nuclear symbols falling down. And in each language it says, you know, rainwater warning, stay out of the rain. So we didn't get that over here. And other countries had that that were further away from the event. So that's something to please consider. Again, again, in, in Plumegate is this giant conspiracy that hides the plume, the initial plume, which was so deadly, and it's an ongoing thing, as a lot of people are willing to say, the radiation fallout, the continued radiation fallout is an ongoing thing. Although my plume gate in the articles, and the reason I you know, called it plume gate and dubbed it plume gate in the beginning was because the initial plume is where most of the heavy particulates, if you will, came over and hit the, hit the West Coast. I have plenty of articles to that, that effect, what was detected on the West Coast, the differs from the establishment position and these well-paid scientists and industry scientists that they make a lot of money. And I tell you, if you pay a lawyer enough money or a scientist enough money, he will tell you up is down. Okay, frame 37, I call it NEI alignment. And we'll talk about NEI after this. Male participant, I had something else. Female participant, NEI call. National Energy Institute, I believe, is that's what that stands for. Male participant. Marty asked me to call NEI. That's when I stepped out before. Mike Case, okay. Male participant. Angela talked to Marty. Ralph Anderson talked to us today. NEI took our press release, of course, like everybody else, and they're very interested. NEI wants to stay aligned with us. They don't want us to be speaking and somehow saying something different than we. Or they don't want to be speaking and somehow saying something different than we. They want to stay aligned. In order to be able to do that, they want to be able to have communication with us so that we can talk with each other. And Eric went off to leave to do that. I guess he talked to you. Background conversations. Male participant. That would be helpful because if any eye is looking for the background, we're not going to find it in a press release. Male participant. (laughs) Well, they have that. Male participant, yes, but it's a summary of the male participant. They want to know what was behind background conversations, and that's in parentheses. When I say background conversations, that's the transcriber is hearing a lot of people at once, apparently, and in parentheses, it's a background conversation. They can't all at once tell you what's going on. Male participant, are we protecting the male participant? Yes. Any I want to know what's behind, they want to know what's behind it so that they can be male participant. Are we prepared to share the whole thing with them? Male participant, no. Female participant, if we share it with any I, we need to share it with the world, okay? They're a member of the public as well, right? Male participant, well, if they, you know, there's a, you have the discretion in the releases, you are correct, that once you hand it to any I, you have no basis to withhold it from anyone. But you do have the discretion to decide who you initially give it to, female participant. We can explain it on the phone easily, easily enough to get them understanding. It's very big when you read the beginning of it. Male participant. Okay, well, we'll just rack that away for a while. Male participant. But there's a difference here. Male participant. I don't mind. Female participant. I understand. Male participant. Handing them over the details and stuff. I don't mind handing them over the details and stuff. Male participant. We're getting there. That's where it started. Is there a problem with handing it? Yes, there is. Okay. Are we willing to take them through the entire explanation? Female participant. Sure. Male participant. And they can sit there scribbling on the other end and recreate the document that we would have handed them anyhow, but we never handed them a document. Female participant. The short answer, male participant. Done that before. Female participant. But the short answer to them is that the public doesn't know what percentage of core damage and audible. We did not on purpose put that in the press release because it's a little alarming. I felt as the team director, if we put it it in the hypothetical unit, you'll see it in the press. That's the best information. So you see, 
we're never going to get the straight truth. And that's just a fact. There's so many filters of information. Someone probably has a pretty good clue early on what's going on, but it's trapped and there's a drag net and, and information slowed down. And a really good part here is when she says, we did not on purpose put that in the press release because it's a little alarming. Well, they should have come right out and and given us the straight truth early on because the plume is traveling in the air whether you like it or not. And unless they're going to use their weather modification and weather control to change the direction of the jet stream and pull it somewhere else, we are in the direct path of the plume and fall. And indeed, the Mangano Sherman study is a excellent study to look at and get a, a rough idea and estimate of fatalities we have incurred because of the continued fallout and the initial plume. There's plenty of evidence of a cover-up, and we're going to continue to cover that. And I don't know for how long, but there's thousands of pages, thousands of pages. A lot of them are just as good as all this stuff. It really shows you the underbelly of the nuclear industry. And they, in my opinion, are the most powerful of the players industry-wide. I know some will say Chevron and Exxon and all these other oil companies, and I, they do have a lot of clout. I don't, I don't doubt that, but don't underestimate the nuclear power industry because it certainly seems, and tomorrow night I'll cover this with my weaponized weather discussion, it certainly seems they have a lot of power as well, a lot of power, just as it shows in the Illuminati card game. There's a number of, and you see these in my videos on YouTube, there's a number of cards that allude to the nuclear industry having control and strange things going on with the nuclear industry. Now, frame 42. I titled this Plume Out to Sea. Don't know what's in it. Chuck, DOE is going to go brief the ambassador, so I'm back on with you guys. Jack, let me just share with you a couple of ways that I've explained this, and maybe it will help you. First off, you have to recognize that the plume is going out to sea right now. Chuck, yes. Jack, and there are no measurements here. Chuck, yes, that's another Jack, right? Chuck, there are no measurements in the plume, which we would typically have an emergency response. So we don't actually know what is in the plume. These are measurements of deposition that was made several days ago. I thought that was an interesting one. They're discussing a plume. They know there's a plume. There's plenty of evidence for a plume, plenty of evidence it's headed out to sea. And they know everything I know about the Pacific jet stream that the pilots use and Certainly debris, some debris will be carried aloft, small, tiny particulates, and then radiation emanation, and, and that's what fallout is. And, and once you study nuclear power and you, you lift the veil back, you understand that during a severe criticality, it is very difficult to contain radiation, and it's not just local in Fukushima. And there's horror stories coming out of there right now. That's not what this is about. We're going to stick to the documents. But the point is clear I'm making here. You cannot put it back in the bag. It's a Pandora's box. Once it's out, it's out, and the consequences are there for many years to come. You can ignore the, as Ann Ryan said, you can ignore the reality, but not the consequences of reality, and that's very true, especially with nuclear power. Okay, we're just after the one-hour mark here on the NRC FOIA document, Freedom of Information documents. I will quickly remind you to please visit Uncovering Plume Gate. That is a WordPress blog that my friend Donna has put together. It's very nicely done, and please go there and familiarize yourself and help us to uncover more of these documents and, and what, they, what they mean, what the implications are. And this is 43 titled Radioactive Cloud. Again, I title these to kind of give me an idea what I'm going to be reading. Mark Erline, or Erlene, that's inaudible. We know from feedback we've gotten this is becoming a very popular call. So that was really not well and audible on our part, and we'll get it cleaned up tomorrow for sure. Just a quick rundown of what went through. I mean, the call mainly focused on inaudible issues. It was announced that missing Americans last night. It was announced about missing Americans last night. And there was also a revelation of a radioactive cloud. I think it was Miller that talked about that. And it would have been great to have had some more detail on that. But just to let you know that was out there, and that will come up again tomorrow in terms of more information. Brian McDermott. So the radioactive cloud you're talking about, you're talking about on the ground in Japan? Mark Erline. That's correct. Brian McDermott. Okay. Male participant. Brian, from my understanding, that NOAA actually gave a 
they stated a 19-mile radioactive cloud moving down the Japanese coast. Brian McDermott, down the Japanese coast, male participant. Where is that coming from? Male participant, yes, we don't know. Male participant, that's why I called you as soon as I was notified and said get this to public affairs and we'll try to head this off of the past. But I don't, I don't know the impetus behind why it was stated. So, again, evidence of a radioactive cloud. Is this the cloud that reached America? Look, that's not really what's important. The important thing is we want, we want to know what happens when Oyster Creek over here melts down. Let's give them that the cloud never made it over here all the way across the ocean. Okay, we'll, we'll say that. Let's look, look at locally what happens when there's a criticality or multiple criticalities. And clearly the NTTF, the task force, considered a multiple criticality in their recommendations, they would say, keep in mind, it might not just be one uh, uh, container, one containment unit melting down and breaching containment at a time. Maybe you have multiple source terms. Maybe unit one and unit two are affected, and you have to keep that in mind. You want to plan for worst-case scenario, and the very fact that they're recommending that they take measures about this is, is clear indication. They're not prepared for it now. Now, we've got a number of Mark I containments over here, but not all are an identical design is my understanding. And I'm, I'm probably not prepared to – I think it's like six over here that are very similar and others that are a Mark I containment but not as close in design. That's kind of my rough understanding. But Oyster Creek, I'm certain, is the Mark I containment, and it's older than the one at Fukushima. So that's the one we're really worried about. And some of our spent fuel pools over here contain quite a bit of – of st uh, stocked, overstocked, spent fuel that's just been sitting there. And this is, again, a great worry. Robert Alvarez is the guy to look into. He's got a study out on these spent fuel pools. And if you check my YouTube channel, I also have a breakdown of that in video format you can listen to under the Robert Alvarez spent fuel pool issue here in America. Okay, Cali, roof on Unit 1 and Unit 3, comma 4, spent fuel pool. Mike Case, I would say we're focused on the whole site. You know what's important, rises and falls based on the latest information. I just heard now that Unit 1, apparently, the roof collapsed on top of the spent fuel pool. Mail participant, well, we're waiting for the chairman to call. Mike Case, inaudible. That Unit 1 had a problem. Mail participant, but the back roof is inaudible. Mike Case, Unit 1, the roof collapsed onto the fuel pool. So we don't know what the status is of the fuel in the pool for Unit 1. So that could be as dry as Unit 3 or 4. Okay, right there, I wanted to throw that one in there because this shows you the condition on the ground of some of these. At least early on, their information is not entirely accurate, but they, they do have a pretty good idea and a good picture. And what you want to keep in mind the overall thrust is early on. They, they know about the plumes. They know it's serious. There's guys in there to downplay it. There's people in there to cover it up. And we are not giving given the warnings that other countries were. That's my main thrust of what you need to get out of, of, of this and, and these other documents. Number 46 is titled Unit 3. Again, we're talking about Unit 3 plume. Primary containment has some damage. The greatest concern right now, let me back up one, 350, okay, this is in sequential order. This comes after what I just read. Primary containment has some damage. The greatest concern right now is the Unit 3 spent fuel pool and possibly the Unit 2 spent fuel pool. But Unit 3 spent fuel pool, there's observed, visually observed, substantial plume, which appears to be a steam plume continuing to emanate from the Unit 3 reactor building debris. It does not appear to be smoke. It appears to be water vapor. So it appears that the spent fuel is boiling the water in the spent fuel pool. Unit 4, all the fuel is in the spent fuel pool. There is substantial damage, as you recall, to the reactor building. It appears that there was damage to fuel rods during the explosion. They attempted to dump water into the Unit 4 spent fuel pool from a helicopter. That was not successful. They're in the process, and we are supporting this process, of trying to identify a methodology to spray water into the spent fuel pool of Unit 4. The radiation dose levels range approximately from 100 to 1,000 millirem per hour. That's 100 millirem per hour to 1 rem per hour at the site boundary. 
Closer to the plant, it ranges depending on times that the measurements are taken from 30 to 300 rem per hour in the immediate vicinity of the facilities. We have our first substantial amount of data from the Department of Energy flyovers, the aerial monitoring systems. Those aerial runs ran back and forth in a serpentine pattern within approximately a mile of the facility. That's the closest they came to the facility. And those runs show what we believe to be radioactive deposition to the west and south of the plant. The runs did not go into the areas where the plume would be, which is currently blowing out to sea. But they did show deposition on the range of 10 to 30 millirem per hour, a meter above the soil. Okay, real quick before I go on. I mean, really crazy right there, a couple of things. I mean, if you look at first, closer to the planet ranges depending on time, so the measurements are taken from 30 to 300 rem per hour in the immediate vicinity of the facility. So the protective action guidelines say 5 rem, I'm certain that's per year, per individual, 0.5 for a pregnant woman, and that's incredible REM. Again, that's indicative of the, you know, you can't hide it this time like Chernobyl or Three Mile. It's pretty clear and clear evidence in these documents of the just severe nature. Workers won't go in. They're having to bulldoze stuff over to drop the REMs down, 30 to 300 REMs per hour in the immediate vicinity of the facility. And that is catastrophic. And the nuclear industry does not want people to know that. The the people watching football and voting Romney and Obama, they clearly don't know. They clearly have no idea. They would have voted third party. So we've got a long ways to go in informing Americans as to the reality of nuclear power. It's not this beautiful thing they make it out to be. Now, in the second part of this section here, it says the aerial runs ran back and forth in a serpentine pattern within approximately a mile of the facility. The runs did not go into areas where the plume would be which is currently blowing out to sea. Now, I don't expect them to drive right to the plume, okay? I'm not unreasonable. But logic would dictate you want, to, you want to inspect, you want to study, you want to measure, you want to take data, you want to track, you want to keep an eye on the plume. You know, you know all winds run from there to here. That's a fact, and it's not going in the other direction unless there's a polar shift and the earth starts spinning in the other direction. So it's patently ridiculous. It's, it's criminal negligence, and at some point you have to ask yourself, is there a reason they're not, they don't do things properly the way common sense would dictate? You don't have to be an expert to apply common sense and say, you know, track that plume, watch that plume. That just makes sense. Do you care about us or not? Do they care about pregnant women in California and on the West Coast, 0.5 rem per year? They won't talk about plutonium or the uranium or the mox fuel. I mean, wow. All I can say is wow on that. Okay, frame 48. <clears throat> Continuing, unit three, plume. There's a lot of calculations that go into that because these are measurements that are being taken from an airplane, actually a helicopter, I guess. But they calculate what would be the dose rates a meter above the ground based on what they're measuring up in the air. And those dose rates range from 10 to 30 millirem per hour east and south of the plant. And then north of the plant, the rates are on the order of one to a tenth to a hundredth of a millirem per hour, so substantially lower in the north. We believe that this is ground deposition. It's substantial ground deposition from earlier in the week's explosion and material becoming airborne at the time when the wind was blowing inland instead of out to sea. Jack Rose. Good evening. This is Jack Rose. There's a number of people here with me in the executive team that are listening into this. There have been a number of developments today that I wanted to update you on. First, let me go through the condition of the plant. And this is a good summary here. Check this out. Unit one has core damage. Fuel is being cooled, but possibly not completely covered. Containment is intact. Unit two has core damage. Cooling is getting to the fuel, but the fuel might be as much as a third uncovered. Primary containment has some damage. Spent fuel pools on Unit 1 and 2, we don't have any indication that there's a problem there. Unit 3, that doesn't mean that there isn't a problem. We just don't have any indication that there is. Unit 3, the core is damaged. It's approximately half uncovered is the best information we have. Okay, and that's the end of that. That's, and there's a couple really good breakdowns of the Unit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and there's better, better than that. 
but in that section, you clearly again you see the the, the the severity of the meltdown, and there's no easy there's no easy way in, and there's no easy way out. It, here you also see that they discuss clearly, you know, airborne particulate plumes going out to sea. Again, you have to ask me to believe uh, uh, just something that's impossible that they don't know what I've been able to learn in less than. I've been reporting on. Plume gate. I broke plume gate in February 27th, so of, of this year. So I've been reporting on it since then, many months now, many months now. And you'd have to ask me to believe something totally ridiculous that they haven't learned what I've learned about plumes and Chernobyl and Three Mile and all these other incidents, and especially Fukushima. And these guys are the experts and been in a long time. I tell you that this industry is really covering itself and covering its tracks well, and I'm sure the cancer treatment industry is not complaining at all. By the way, real quick, back to the National Energy Institute. Those are the ones that question the Tooth Fairy Project, and I would ask you just real quickly to Google Tooth Fairy Project. That's the Mangano uh, character from the Sherman Mangano study, and he's got an excellent study project called the Tooth Fairy Project. I think Alec Baldwin is a supporter of it. And I strongly suggest you Google it and look into it because any eye says it's bunk, and the Tooth Fairy Project is, is bunk science. So please investigate that when you have time. Okay, frame 60. Hey, this might be okay. We're at the last frame. We did well tonight, just over an hour. Frame 60, mitigation, not monitor. JASCO meets with Lighthouse. Okay, Chairman JASCO, JASCO, J-A-C-Z-K-O, JASCO. Keep up the good work, and let's keep doing what we're doing, which is good timely decision-making with good information. And I think, as Bill mentioned yesterday, our focus probably now more than anything is on our focusing on how we can do mitigation. To some extent, the monitoring is not of the situation is not as important anymore. I think it's the mitigation strategies. And Chuck seems like he's had a breakthrough. So we want to take advantage of that and get them good, accurate, reliable information as soon as we can. My case, absolutely. Chairman Jack, go. Okay, good. Well, thanks. I'm heading over to the White House. I'm going to do a – I'll likely do the White House press briefing, so maybe I'll call you back in 15 minutes if we can do – if you can just do a run-through for me of updated information and anything you think I need to know before that briefing. Again, here's more evidence, and I will have a file folder that's specifically White House connection, who's meeting with White House, when they're meeting with White House, and giving them these – briefs and these, these updates. Also, I think here when they talk about mitigation, I don't think it's so much information or cover-up in that area. I think what they're saying is mitigation of trying, trying to cool and contain the radiation and, and handle the situation on the ground. So I think that's to be noted there as well. Um, okay, that's pretty much going to cover up what I wanted to do tonight, and that gave you the entire that's number 60, so we covered it. And not actually 60 frames, but I ended up on that was the last one I replaced at the end of my files here. So that is the 507 page, I call it the California document, because again, the, the, one of the best parts is where they discuss the doses to children in California. And we know children are effect, affected in a much more negative manner because their cells are dividing at a higher rate than an adult. So that's to keep in mind, and also those protective action guidelines, a 5 rim for an adult per year and to a pregnant woman, 0.5 rim. So even if they say, well, it's just minimal, it's just minimal, look, that's not going to fly according to all the information. It's just a mountain of information. Now, my, my assumption and my investigations really led me to believe we got hit a lot harder than, than they want to make out, and, I, and there's plenty of evidence at the plutonium levels and other things like that that are, that are pretty serious and need to be taken into consideration. And, and I always remind people that the moneyed interests, they, they hold sway over the, the global information world because they have such clout financially. They're able to buy people, and people will, as many of you well know, you wouldn't be here listening tonight or in the alternative media or searching for this information if you didn't know that some, some people can be bought into silence or to telling you things that aren't true or exaggerating or distorting the truth. So that's what I do here, and that's what we're going to continue to do as we pursue the NRC Freedom of Information documents. And please, folks, freedom of information, it's a beautiful thing. If they ever take that away, 
I will have nothing. I mean, redaction is, is bad. I, I grant that. But some things slip through, and when you comb through this blizzard of documents, eventually I'm going to be able to, you, as you join me, you'll be able to see this picture of how the nuclear industry operates and how a cover-up unfolds and, and, and get to know better the nuclear industry because you can't but arrive at one conclusion after reading these documents, and that is we've got to, as soon as possible, systematically begin to shut down these plants and get the, the spent fuel cooled. It takes years to do that and get into dry cast. If jobs will be created. We'll release suppressed solar technology and suppressed technologies, thousands, thousands, 5,000 plus the patents in the United States now being suppressed. And I've talked about my father's invention also being you know, played with by the Bush and Obama where they, he fills out his proposal and they'll even have a press conference and talk up the good talk, but in the end, they never, they never spend the money, folks. They never do because it's protecting a monopoly. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for tonight. I thank everyone for joining me. And, and again, one last time, I really want to thank everyone on YouTube who's come together to carry this information. Today when I saw Resonate had it on there and Dutch Sense had liked it, and I thought to myself, this is pretty, this is pretty good. Things, you know, information can circulate if we all get involved and we all try and we we have to come together now and form an independent network. It has, it has to be an underground movement like the Underground Railroad. Otherwise, the information is not going to circulate. And I will say this, the awakening, it's real. I don't know how fast it's going on, but it, it is real. Even people I know personally are coming around, and, and as they gain new information, we continue to hammer home these facts. You know, a lot of these are facts, indisputable facts in these documents, the way they, they handle these things. People's minds are changing, and they're getting information, and hopefully we're going to change the world, folks. So join me back here two days from now. I'll go back into the four-year documents. I'm going to go into that 86-pager, and I'll take some screen captures, and I'll, again, I'm not just going to forget about this, and we'll tie it back into some of these these issues. Tomorrow night, however, I will do a discussion on, weaponized weather because I feel it ties in with the nuclear industry being there blaming climate change. And when you hear the term climate change, just replace it with this term, weaponized weather, and see how that works for you. They're blaming it on coal, oil, and natural gas. Everyone's a nuclear power, wouldn't you know? Okay, see you guys tomorrow night and two nights from now back to the FOIA documents. This is Patrick Penry, over and out.